When George Mallory's body was found in 1999 on Mount Everest, a panel was formed by the Eastman Kodak Company to discuss the handling of the camera and the film processing. Todd Gustafson, who is the curator of the technology collection at the George Eastman Museum, was on that panel. The camera was to be kept frozen and brought back to Rochester, New York, where the film would be processed by Michael Hager, and that pretty much is where it stands today, more than 20 years after the discovery of George Mallory. And what's even more interesting is, is that the Kodak Vest Pocket B, which has been named in multiple documentaries and books, wasn't even being made in 1924. So apparently the teams have been looking for the wrong camera. Now, the camera does look almost identical, but I got Todd Gustafson on an interview, on a Zoom call, who explained the differences between the cameras, and he also talked about the developing of the film and the viability of developing the film if that camera was found with film in it. According to one of the photographic experts, the film was to be kept frozen until just before development, thus preserving its physical state. And secondly, a small snipping of the roll's end would be taken in total darkness and processed to determine the exposure and the type of images recorded on the film. The processing solutions would be likely kept at temperatures of no more than 70 degrees. For those photographic developers out there, this makes sense to you. With a reduced activity developer to minimize image grain, and as a result, longer developing times would be used. Before I get to the interview with Todd Gustafson, I hope you'll take a moment to subscribe and like and share this video and also take the time to comment. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. It's just another layer peeled back in the mystery of Mallory and Irvin. If that film and camera is ever found, the answer to one of the 20th century's greatest mysteries will be found and solved by a humble pocket-sized camera. Now to my interview with Todd Gustafson of the Eastman Museum. Hey, it's great seeing you. Thank you for taking time out of your day. You know, you, I don't know if you, it sounds like you're in demand. Well, I don't know. I mean, that's trying to figure out what, well, try to explain to people what I do for a living. It's really complicated because you never know what's going to happen. I got to go look at a, uh, a, a box in somebody's trunk that was supposed to be a projector it turned out to be an accordion. So, you know, it's just, <laughs> It's always a always a funny day, but uh, so let, let me let me give you a little bit of, of my knowledge of this. So this is back in 1999. I, I've been I started working at the at the George Eastman House at the time now George Eastman Museum in 1988. So about 1999, when they found Mallory's body, uh, I was contacted by Kodak Eastman Kodak Company, and we put together a, basically a panel. Of, of, of experts, you know, who are going to, whatever, we are going to handle the camera and get the film process. So, so basically, uh, the camera was to come over here, it was going to go to our conservation lab, I, I was going to identify the camera, they were going to unload it, the film was going to go to Michael Hager, who is a local museum guy, uh, he used to work here as our negative archivist, he probably knows more about processing old film than anybody in the world, which is why I was going to go here, he was going to do it, and that was that. That was the plan. Uh, I think Bob Schoenberg was involved in it at the time and probably a couple of the Kodak PR people because uh, that's probably how the contact was made. So that's where it stood. And of course, we had a rather long, interesting conversation about what the film was likely going to be like. And, and uh, it's, it's kind of a crapshoot. I mean, just, just because I thought you'd be interested, this is a box from the right vintage uh, of, of what so that's that's exa essentially the size of a rolled up roll of film that would right. have been it's, in one this of those. Is what it would have looked like in the camera, right? Wow. The, the conversation gets to be a little complicated because there's a lot of variables here that we just don't know, uh, or I don't know. Maybe you guys do. My, my, the, the first question that pops up uh, to me, uh, Hillary used. Uh, the Retina 118. So this this is a, a Retina 118 standard off the shelf camera. And while he was here, you know, he just, just sent me a PDF on what well, how Hillary prepared. So they were told uh, they did not 
remove the grease from the shutter from the lens. They were told to keep the camera in their sleeping bag to keep it warm. So they were opening and closing it, but the camera was kept warm. So we don't know if Mallory did that or not. That's actually is a very big deal. So we know that Hillary succeeded in taking pictures and that would have been on Kodachrome, uh, which would have been in a metal pack, metal cassette like this, a lot more durable, uh, more durable film. So if you look at this camera, you see it does, it is a bellows folding camera. The bellows is very, very small in this. It only opens about yay far. Uh, and it's, it's actually a much higher quality bellows than the cameras that, we're, that we'll talk about in a minute. So again, opening and closing would be a fairly simple thing. Um, I guess you could do this with gloves on in your sleeping bag. I don't know. Uh, the one thing that they were told to do was to use a UV filter on the lens because it was not a coated lens. Uh, and it was going to get foggy, so they had to clean the lens. As soon as you, as soon as you take a warm camera out and you know into the cold, the lens is going to steam up just like your glasses do. So we know that worked, okay? So uh, I had always assumed when we're talking about this that it was a vest pocket Kodak, and this is the vest pocket Kodak. It's you know it, it's uh, around the same vintage as what we're talking about here, and you know shutter. I don't know if you can hear that. It goes click, click, click. Oh yeah. It's, it's a very simple ball bearing shutter. It basically has two speeds. Uh, that's what I assume they, and as far as folding it goes, it's just a, a uh, you know, accordion type thing. Very simple, you know. It's a metal body camera, pretty sturdy. Uh, loading this is gonna be kind of complicated. It, it, it's, it's something you can't do with gloves on. You're gonna have to do this in a warm place. It's not easy to do. All right, so you're, you're basically gonna take the, 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 the little tab on the film. See, there's a little paper here. I'm not used to doing this upside down and backwards, so to speak. So it's going to have to go in like this. Like yes, this. gotcha. And then you'll put the bottom of the camera back on. So, so that's that's how the vest pocket Kodak loads. To cut to the chase, uh, when I watched the uh, the national uh, the the NPR special PBS special, we'll get the right now network. Uh, a couple of years ago, I mean, I've been talking to Tom Ozell about this and I watched the show and they were talking about the vest pocket Kodak Model B and there's like this bell ringing in my head because the vest pocket Model B doesn't come out until October of 1926. They couldn't have had one. It wasn't made yet. Uh, he asked, well, could they have acquired a pre-production model? And I said, well, they're in England. It would actually have been farther down the road than that. So I don't think so. I mean, it's, I can't say. Uh, but I do know that the camera that they were folding up looked more like this. It had a folding bottom. And I said, well, that's a folding pocket Kodak series two, which was available at that time. It's a bigger camera. That's why we weighed the cameras. You know, uh, Mr. Hosell asked about the weights and there, this is a little bit heavier, not a lot, uh, bigger camera though. So it depends on what they're trying to do. If they're interested in the size, I don't know. And as far as the, 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 the Model B, Kind of looks like this, but you can see in comparison, they're, they're quite a bit straight, like a third bigger in size. Yeah. Almost identical in appearance, mind you, but but larger in size. So that's that's the first issue. And I'm thinking, well, they're looking for the wrong camera, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or, or that's a big know. issue. Well, if if you're looking for a needle in the haystack and you're, you're, you're and you're looking for a knitting needle in the haystack, you're not going to find it. And honestly, I don't know. I haven't done the research on this. I'm just going by what I've heard. Uh, uh, so then we get into the next kind of question: is the 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 uh, I don't know viability of the film, which is the conversation that we had at Eastman Kodak Company years ago. Uh, they may have painted a maybe a rosier picture on it because they made the film, I don't know. But it, I was just talking with one of my guys who actually went through our film conservation school uh, and, and basically nitrate film right here. Uh, what it, then this is still pretty viable. Uh, you can see that it's you know still has something there. But as it ages, it's gonna turn brown, it's gonna curl, uh, it's gonna become, it's gonna shrink, and then it's gonna turn into dust. So. And, and how long that's gonna take is really gonna depend on a couple of things. A lot of it has to do with the climate that it's, that it's stored in. Uh, if it's sitting outside on a camera like this, it's gonna depend on how the camera lands. 
Yeah. If the camera was closed up, the film will be viable for a longer period of time. If the camera is open, the bellows is probably going to rot. If it really depends on the, the, the viability of the bellows, it has to do with the viability of the film. If the if the bellows goes, the film is done. So that's that's really the question. Yeah. So if if let's say the camera was closed and it was in a pocket or in a backpack and it wasn't, it was like maybe even under a body, then it's then it's basically just frozen in the dark. Right. And it's not going to melt. It's not going to get warm up there. Right. The size of it, see, it, it's the combination of sun and incredibly dry air that's going to be the huge problem for this stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. the dryer is going to be a problem. The sun is the worst. It's like the enemy of film is sun. Uh, so if he's, if they're keeping it in their sleeping bag and they're closing the camera and it was closed when they fall, then it's got a chance. If it's open when they fall, it doesn't have a chance, mm. quite likely. And also, Tied if it's up. open when they fall, who it could go? It could fly any place. Yeah, it could flip out of a pocket. So, are just, there other instances historically of, say, hundred-year-old film being found in frozen conditions, and then the photos getting developed? There is some evidence. And it's, it's uh, I mean, if, if we wanted to walk this back a little bit, uh, just to give you a, an idea before we get to the frozen part. So over the years, uh, as we've inventoried collections, uh, I had a, a number of volunteers who had actually processed films that we found in old cameras. We, they just did it because it was kind of fun. They're retired guys, uh, they like to do it. And as far as, the, 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 the feasibility of actually getting an image out of them was pretty low, actually. Now, that has to do with whether the film was ever exposed to begin with, uh, the aging of the film, uh, et cetera. I mean, I, I think we had like a, 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 about a 10 to 15 percent chance of getting an image out of something like that. And again, it's, this stuff has been stored in attics and basements, so not frozen. So just because as film ages, I mean, there's a reason why they put an expiration date on it. You know, uh, that that's not good. Uh, frozen wise, I believe they found some film in Antarctica ten or fifteen years ago and processed that and did get images out of that. So it, it's not impossible, but again, it's it's really going to depend on frozen and the conditions along with being frozen. Mm. Frozen and dark would be the best. So, right. you know, it's 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 a real crapshoot, so to speak. Everything has to be really, really well planned, or it doesn't go well. Whether Mallory and Hillary, or I should say Irvine. Mallory and, and Irvine, uh, were this specific, you know, they weren't military guys. You know, they they may have not realized how complicated this was going to be. I mean, they realized it was complicated, but how complicated is a whole other matter. And and you, how would you, how would you know? Because nobody's been there. You don't know what you're going to find. I mean, maybe there's a nice person who's going to develop the film already waiting there. You, you know, unlikely, but you don't know. This, uh, this is a, a series. This, this is a series two folding pocket Kodak that that I loaned to a gentleman who was trying to recreate images that were first shot at Machu Picchu, and we went with this instead of a a three A system for it. Uh, so this one actually has a new bellows. I tuned the bellows up for him. It was kind of a fun little project, but you know. I, again, it was a very rehearsed thing. So, yeah, yeah, we had a, a strict set of instructions if the camera was found, not only in 1999, but in 2019. And boy, we had to handle that thing really carefully. And then in 99, I think we probably wouldn't have had a problem getting it out of the country but then how do you get it out of the country how do you get it on an airplane do you have dry ice to keep it cold you wrap it in airtight watertight you know plastic it it just getting it to the the place where the attempt was right. going to be made right. was was going to be a monumental task right you basically want to keep it as much as possible in the environment that you find it in and you'll solve those problems when you can, I don't know, smuggle it out of where it's, where it is. So, I mean, this, 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 these are the complications without even getting into the politics of, of the, you know, this person says this and that person heard that, which is, you know, about as, 
unreliable <laughs> scientific information as you can have. Uh, I mean, I, I started out with, gee, would the camera work? And they said, well, maybe, depending on some details, and, and could it survive? And again, there's all there's a, a lot of these maybe things uh, that that you just don't have an answer to. And at least I, I've never seen enough of the documentation to to convince me, unlike Hillary, that the camera would have worked. And again, I, I'm I'm I don't know if I'm playing the the, uh, the the good cop or the bad cop here. I'm I'm just trying to say, well, there's a lot of things that I'm not sure that, and maybe these have been talked about. I don't know. I haven't been involved in the conversation. And and that's good, but but it's also very helpful to have the pessimist in that conversation and say, you know, this is probably not going to work. And um, and so when that person speaks, you listen, and then you make every possible, you know, kind of arrangement around that to, you know, try to prevent snafus from happening. But until we find that camera. We, we don't know anyway. And, and, you know, with the recent report that supposedly the Chinese found it and then bungled the developing of the film, it, you know, it, it, uh, of course they did. I mean, how, like, if they did have it. Yeah, yeah. well, here, here's the thing uh, on the bungled processing of the film. Um, this film, from, from my experience in processing old film, either something on it or it's not. How are you going to bungle it? And so as far as bungling it, it's not that complicated. I mean, they, they, they could have, when, when you're processing roll film like this, I don't, I don't really know. When they said they bungled it, I'm kind of scratching my head saying, well, what's the bungle? <laughs> it's, it's not that complicated. It's, 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 a, it's a developer, a stop and a fixer. Claiming that they bungle it to me is, is, is um, definitely a head scratch. Yeah, I think maybe then then the others are saying, well, then they didn't bungle it. They did it on purpose or they developed the film and they said they bungled it because it has proof of Mallory and Irvin making it to the summit, which is titillating to think like, oh, my gosh, there's a big conspiracy. But yeah, it, 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 it really does have a conspiracy sound to it to me. And, 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 and again, the, we're living in it, the era of conspiracy theories. So but 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 again, it's. I mean, there, there's a difference between processing a, 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 an old black and white film. It's just it's just fairly simple chemistry versus trying to process Kodachrome now, which is a whole different kettle of fish. You know, it's yeah. it's it, you're using chemistry that that still exists. Uh, your your results are going to vary a little bit, but you're going to get something. Uh, I, I spent a time working as a photographer, and uh, uh, you know, I, I studied fine art photography in school. I mean, there, there, there's, you know, trying to get the highest level processing out of something versus just something. Uh, I, I processed uh, a C41 uh, color chemistry, you know, in, in a room that was 45 degrees using hot water to keep it warmed up. I mean, it just stuff that, and, and you still got results. I mean, you got something. So, I mean, it's, it, it, it not as, it's not as hard as they're trying to imply that they bungled it. Todd, thanks for taking the time to speak to me today. I truly appreciate it. And for those who've been watching, if you're interested in learning more about the museum, go to eastman.org. I'll put a link to that museum in the notes to this video. Also, I'll provide a link to all of the books that Todd has written about photography. Please take a minute out of your time to subscribe or like, and then comment if you have something that you'd like to add about developing of the film or about the camera. Thanks very much for being here. I truly appreciate it. Hopefully I'll have some more interesting things for you real soon. Peace out.